Welcome to Liquid Margins. This is Annotation Lab, Social Reading and STEM. Today's guests are um, Beverly Rainey, Ranny, <laughs> Ranny like Franny. Uh, she's a professor of biology at Barstow Community College. We have with us once again on Liquid Margins, Carlos Goller. He's associate teaching professor at North Carolina State University and Melanie Linehan, Professor of Biology, Raritan Valley, Valley Community College. And our moderator is Jeremy Dean. Um, we do have a big biology focus here today. So uh, that just this happenstance, um, but you know, great, I love it. Um, so, but we'll be talking about, uh, you know, uh, social annotation in general, not just uh, how it applies to STEM topics, but in particular, how it does apply to STEM topics. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy. So um, take it away, I'll see you all on the flip side. Thanks so much, uh, Franny, and, and great to be here today. Um, I did wanna provide a little bit of context uh, for myself. I'm an English PhD. Um, and I've always been a, a humanities person throughout my life. However, my, both my parents are scientists and two of three siblings are scientists. And my wife is an academic biologist. So I do have something of a clue, um, but I am coming from a very different place. And I'm excited to hear about um, your use of social annotation. I think for a lot of people, um, when we talk to instructors and administrators at schools, it's very obvious why social annotation would be used in humanities courses. And it probably is obvious to you guys because you're active hypothesis users, but sometimes it takes some convincing um, or some discussion to explain why you might use such a tool in, uh, in science courses. And, and I hope we can sort of talk that out uh, today. Um, great to see so many people today. Wow, this is the biggest turnout we've ever seen for liquid margins. I don't know if you guys have nothing to do in the summer as being academics, uh, so everybody's here, but I'm glad to see so many uh, folks in the, in the chat. Um, I want to just start by getting to know you all a little bit better, uh, getting to know more about the institution you teach at, um, the discipline you teach in, and the types of courses you teach, just so we have some context for where you're coming from. And let's start with you, Beverly. So I teach at Barstow Community College. Um, we're an institution of about 2,100 students. And I teach, uh, we're a department now of three full-time uh, professors and I teach microbiology and the major's biology sequence primarily. And then I wander into environmental science uh, as well. But as a community college, we're open access. And so I have a range of students um, who've been in college who are, who are traditional students. And then I've got a bunch of students who are non-traditional students and everyone in between. So it's a, it's a great uh, place we've been um, leading into online education as a way to address equity and equity gaps. And so my classes for the last um, five years have been online. So it's been, the addition of hypothesis has been a great, a great tool. Thanks Beverly. And I, I can see in the chat that you have some other community, California Community College folks in the audience here. So you're not alone. I'm just back from OTC in Long Beach, the online teaching conference for California Community Colleges. We have tremendous use in the California Community Colleges, but again, it's a lot, most of it is in the English courses, especially English 1A. Um, and that's at least where it started, but we're starting to see more and more science courses. Uh, let's go to you next, Melanie, and tell us just a little bit more about uh, like I said, your institution and uh, your discipline and the courses you teach. And I liked how um, Beverly added a little more kind of demographic context um, to who she's teaching and what kinds of students she has in her courses. Yeah, thank you. Um, Melanie Lenahan. I'm a professor of biology at Raritan Valley Community College, and we are in central New Jersey. And I teach on um, general biology, genetics, and cell and molecular biology. Um, like Beverly at a community college, we do see a range of uh, students that are coming in at, at all different levels. Um, I do teach, the biology I teach is designed for science majors. However, I also get a range of students with different backgrounds um, that are coming into, uh, into that course. 
Um, and that's where I've primarily used um, hypothesis is with my general biology uh, students. And um, I love it. <laughs> so I'm really happy uh, to be here to uh, talk with you about how I use it in my classes. Thanks, Melanie. To you, Carlos. Carlos Scholar, and I'm a teaching faculty member at North Carolina State University. So most of my job is developing molecular biology courses for undergraduates and graduate students, because as a campus we teach, uh, we offer courses for the entire campus. And it's been great because um, we assign readings and we have moved to electronic lab notebooks and gone a little paperless and or hopefully mostly paperless and this this ties right in and really allows me to to have asynchronous discussions and with melanie melanie and i have learned together some some tricks and some uses and i think there's a lot more we can learn about pedagogy side, how to pose questions or encourage, and from the uh, student side, how can we make sure they use uh, the resources they annotate afterwards? Lots, lots of fun stuff. That's great. Um, I think you kind of covered this a little bit, uh, Carlos, but I sort of want to go back across the, starting with you and go back across, like what, what attracted you to social annotation? Why did you feel like you needed this tool? You talked a little bit about the moving paperless, but you also got into discussion. I mean, why, why was social annotation a tool that att was attractive to you for your um, molecular biology courses? I, I, and I think a couple of you have heard this story. It was uh, my, my, great friends and, and enablers here are the librarians. And I was having a brainstorming session 2018 or 2017, one summer in the library on the whiteboard, how to get students to read what is often complicated molecular biology, bioinformatics papers, for a broader audience, because not everyone has, what's rich about these courses is that we get students from all over campus. And, and one of the librarians said, uh, Will Cross said, what you need is, is a hypothesis. And I was insulted. I'm like, the entire course is based on a hypothesis. And we, we search for samples and do things. And I think what really drew me to hypothesis was it it we we can have discussions and share knowledge before we meet in class. And that class turned into virtual class the last couple of years. And yet it was still useful discussions. And it's not just rehashing what the main points of paper are, it's, it's going what I would call lateral, going with a connections to other papers through links, um, definitions, um, uh, finding out a little bit more about the authors and who does the science. That's great. And you're, you're mostly reading, were you saying, complicated sort of academic articles, and you were sort of getting at the idea that like, Obviously, students are not always uh, coming in completely literate in how to um, tackle that kind of reading, and this was a helpful tool for them. The instructor sometimes doesn't know because we we pick we pick topics. I'm not a bioinformatician. I'm I'm a microbiologist, and lots of the tools we're using depend on bioinformatics. So it was a way mm -hmm. for us to learn together with me being vulnerable enough to say, what do you all think about this? Yeah, smarter together. I love it, reading in community. Uh, Melanie, how about you? Tell us a little bit about what attracted you to social annotation. I don't know if you want to add, it sounds, I, I actually don't remember the connection between you and Carlos. So if there is some backstory there, you could also share, share that with us. 
but also what attracted you to social annotation for, for teaching um, uh, your students, science majors? Yeah, sure. So um, I've met Carlos uh, in a number of different uh, ways. We, we connected through um, Biome, uh, which is a uh, summer uh, conference that's actually starting on <laughs> this coming Monday. Um, and then uh, we just uh, connected on a number of different uh, um, uh, ways through um, different learning communities. And we actually uh, facilitated a learning community together um, this past spring. So I'm really happy uh, to be able to work with Carlos on a lot of different um, projects. And um, we did give a presentation at my college on um, hypothesis in STEM. Um, we created a little Slack channel uh, that got some traction. Um, so I could invite others if they wish to join our, our um, hypothesis in STEM Slack channel. Um, so that, that's the connection there. And really the, my first introduction to social annotation was um, during the pandemic, obviously, I had not taught online previously. And so that pivot um, was definitely a, a huge learning curve for me. And I was introduced to social annotation through um, actually faculty learning communities. I, it was not something that I had um, used in, in my courses at first. And so I was using um, these social annotation tools through different learning communities with other faculty. And um, then I, I think our, my connection at my college was with Becky, who was on this call, um, who reached out uh, to our college about whether faculty would be interested in using Hypothesis in, in our courses. And um, at that time, I was still virtual online, and I thought this is an excellent way uh, to introduce um, material to students where we can work asynchronously and discuss um, papers. Um, I actually, in my general biology course, I don't typically use um, primary literature articles. Um, instead, uh, news and views <laughs> articles or something that um, is, is going to kind of dive into that topic a little more deeply, but it's not so technical that um, students may get lo lost in the weeds there. Um, but I, I really loved um, using it um, virtually. And now that we're back in face-to-face, -face, I teach all my courses are face-to-face -face now, um, I, I brought it back to the in-person classroom because I think it's a great way to connect with students um, by giving them um, some reading materials prior to coming to core the class or maybe a follow-up um, discussion that we had where I can link them to a particular article um, that's going to you know drive some conversation outside of the classroom. So um, that was that was my introduction uh, to hypothesis and and using it virtually or asynchronously and then bringing it to the classroom. I've also had students work in hypothesis during class sessions as well. Um, so I think it's great for both um, asynchronous work and, and in-person synchronous work. Very cool. I actually wanna ask you a follow-up question, Melanie. Um, just to dig at this, uh, when you mentioned the types of readings that you have students do, right? And you, you kind of alluded to this, so I'm at something of a rehash and I'm somewhat playing devil's advocate, but Carlos is talking about reading dense, difficult microbiology academic articles, which I think, you know, anybody, even, you know, academics can appreciate that some of their own colleagues are writing in ways that are difficult to interpret. But you're talking about reading more popular uh, journalism or, or stuff that might be easier to access and might not need the same kind of translation. But nonetheless, you find social annotation to be useful. Can you just talk a little bit more about, like, this idea? Because there, there's some people that might say, like, well, Obviously, a very dense academic article, maybe a very dense piece of literature needs to be annotated. But like an article at CNN, like, does it need to be annotated? I, I suppose it depends on the education level. But tell me a little bit more about the need to annotate maybe, maybe more straightforward material. Maybe I'm wrong that it's more straightforward. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I, I can give you, uh, you know, one particular example of, of how I've, I've used it. So again, the, the article types I typically choose are um, like a news and views, which would be um, 
the review article of a primary literature um, topic. And um, one, so for example, I'll give you one specific example is that in my general biology course, you know, we talk about enzymes and we talk about enzyme structure and all different aspects of enzyme activity. But I, I would like to relate it to something that is um, relatable to students and, and meaningful in some way. And so one of the articles that I had chosen for that particular topic was enzymes that could degrade plastics. And so there's been uh, recent publications on these types of enzymes um, that, are, that are found that can actually degrade plastics and could be very useful um, for remediation purposes. And so I like to pick an article that I think is gonna engage students um, and take that topic that we, we talk about the content in, in the, our course and relate it to something that they, I feel that they would relate to. Um, and then in the annotation uh, piece, uh, we can ask specific questions or I can ask them to, um, you know, maybe follow up <laughs> with an idea that they might have about how enzymes can be used. Um, so I, 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 that's the, the level that I use, try to use it as a level of engagement to take them, you know, just a little bit further from the content that we're discussing in class. That's great, thanks, Melanie. Beverly, to you, uh, what uh, first attracted you to social annotation as a tool that would be helpful to you and your students? Um, well, I got frustrated with one of my microbiology classes because after an exam, it was clear that they hadn't read anything. And so I did a Google search that was just students read tools kind of a thing. And I stumbled upon hypothesis and I, dove into it and I said, aha, here's, here's how I'm going to foster. Because I thought part of the problem was that they felt disconnected from each other. And so by forcing them into groups and then saying, okay, we're now going to discuss uh, chapter six, here we go. Um, it, it forced them to read and we saw, I saw test scores go back up to um, a happier place for everyone. And we had some really good discuss. I could pinpoint easily where students were stuck and where we needed uh, additional resources and support. And it became clear that students had, had good questions from the material on, on um, what they were assigned reading. And it, it just ensured that I knew that they were reading, they were accountable for the reading, and then we could dive deeper into areas that interested them. Uh, that's great. Um, forcing them to do the reading and then discovering in everybody being forced in there that there's great questions and conversations happening beyond uh, that. So that's not that uh, I love that. Um, how do you introduce students to the tool or to the idea of social annotation? And let's go in reverse order, Be Beverly. Um, I have an introduction video at the, in the first week's module and saying, here's the tool. Here's how, here's how we're going to use it. Here's why we're using it, and I say, you know, I lay out um, your in groups so that you have a, a built-in study group for the course, and you've got an, an instant community, because typically I have sections, or I've got like my microbiology class is, is 120 students, and so that's too big to have just one general discussion, so I'll put them in groups of like 10, and then, then they're more comfortable discussing their ideas and saying, no, I really don't understand X, and um, we go from there. So are you leveraging the Canvas groups integration where you yes. create groups in Canvas and then, okay. And so yeah. different groups are reading the same material but having their own more intimate conversation about it? Yes. And so um, it would be nice if I had the ability to, to just post one example annotation that goes across the 10 groups or, or so. I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but. I think we have to figure that out for you, actually. That's our job to uh, have yeah. the ability to share an annotation in multiple groups. And it is a feature that we've got a lot of requests for, and we'll add another tick to the votes there. Um, there is a sort of secret way, I think, that a backdoor way that we have to kind of ship an annotation to multiple groups. If you get in touch with, uh, with uh, Aaron or with our support team, um, we might be able to help you there. Um, uh, Melanie, how do you introduce students to uh, to social annotation? 
Um, I actually have them annotate the syllabus and um, I just want to thank uh, Becky on this call. It was her suggestion um, to uh, give me a resource uh, called Compass Points, um, like on a compass, east, west, north, south. Um, and each of the, the letters um, stand for a word. So for example, uh, e stands for excited, W is worried, um, S is stands. And um, so right at the very beginning of the course, I have them um, annotate the syllabus. And I have to say this works amazingly well. I get a lot of um, rich discussion. There's a lot of questions. And I, instead of spending class time, you know, reading the syllabus, I can um, assign the annotation, uh, annotate the syllabus assignment. Um, and then when they return to class or if we were virtual, then I can go through all of those um, um, points in the syllabus and discuss it in, in much more detail. So it really serves a few different purposes. One, it introduces them to, an <laughs> to annotation uh, right at the very beginning of the semester. So they're annotating the syllabus. And two, um, is they're reading the syllabus. So I'm, I'm getting feedback and um, conversation and discussion uh, about the syllabus, which I've never done before. Uh, so it's a really great way to um, introduce, for me to introduce um, annotation right, right at the, the start of the course. Carlos, and just a quick question, Melanie, you're using the LMS integration at your school? Yes, uh, we have Canvas, and so I'm using the LMS integration in our Canvas course. Okay, great. Carlos, I think you're using Hypothesis in the wild at NC State, right? They haven't come around to putting it into the into the LMS? Still in the wild. I, I have been trying, and, and hopefully will. I see more and more instructors using it for different things from, from courses to seminar series to, for example, our summer research experience. I do not annotate the syllabus. And I've been wanting to do that and I've never had the guts to do it. I'm not sure, but, but what I've done in the past couple of semesters is, we kind of have an annotation exercise, either asynchronously or uh, synchronously, either on Zoom or in person. Uh, and we annotate a news and views type article or a, a news article together. And, and my goals with that is make sure everyone is annotating in a group, <laughs> in our group, because we annotate in, in groups. Um, I still haven't, although in some cases we have maybe accidentally or, or not accidentally done it publicly, public annotations. But in most cases I have, we work inside a group and I tell students, okay, today let's practice. Let's, let's annotate this. And we're a group of 10 or 12 or 16. Uh, what comes to mind and what would you highlight with, with a highlighter and why is this important? And my main challenge is getting people to ask questions and feel, feel okay asking questions. And one thing that I haven't been good at, but a really great postdoctoral researcher here um, uh, really emphasize it in a different uh, class and, and help me think about it more using tags and creating an annotation mm. before uh, an on, ontology. What Jason Witham did for a, a metabolic modeling of microbial communities class, uh, we shared a spreadsheet and he seeded the spreadsheet with some key terms that he took from the community of metabolic modelers. And then said in the first hypothesis exercise, use some of these tags and, and start annotating. But like Beverly, I use a quick introduction video, 
me showing them how to annotate as best I can within a group. And then we either do it asynchronously or synchronously. And uh, my two goals are feel free to ask questions and feel free to come up with tags that are different from the ones we have. Mm. Cool. Carlos, do you annotate with your students or are they mostly the annotators and you're an observer? We've done this, uh, we've had, this is what I love about being in a, in a teaching program. Um, and with, we've experimented a little bit, both IRB approved and just for our own, own insights. Um, we had one semester where Jason and I tried three variations, uh, instructor not annotating, instructor annotating, and before students. And I know Remy Kalir does it the right way and has done studies. We were basically playing around and then have a peer because we have graduate students who are closer in age, um, uh, pre, pre annotate before. And we saw we saw some trends where our classes are small enough that it's it's hard to do it with statistical significance. But in some cases, that that information convinced me that maybe I should lay off my heavy annotations and let students start by annotating with the grad student. So I usually lay low and then I come back and mm -hmm. and add some comments or I add some annotations so that we focus on certain parts of the article, like the scaffolding or seething, and then let the conversation go and toward the end, bring it back. That's great. Melanie, do you pre-annotate articles for students? Let them have conversation themselves or join the conversation or follow up at a certain point after they've had a conversation or none of the above? <laughs> I think it's more like all, all of the above. So, uh, so I, I just have to mention, um, I, I mentioned earlier that Carlos and I, you know, co-facilitated this uh, learning community. And um, what we felt was really useful was having our participants annotate um, articles and then, but we would seed them <laughs> with, uh, with the different comments. And that became like the stimulus for the conversation. I mean, that was like our jumping point um, for the conversation when we all got to meet. So I do the same for my students. Um, I, I can, you know, uh, see the article. I think that's a good, <laughs> that's a good way to explain, you know, like an analogy, um, put some comments in the, um, annotation comments in the piece to kind of engage the students in a conversation. Um, I also come back and address the questions if they have them, or, um, if, if, Oftentimes they will ask a question as part of the um, annotation and you can create threads, which are really useful. Um, you know, you can put links and text and I, I like using GIFs. <laughs> and um, so I think it, it's, it's really great. So I think I, I would answer that question both. You know, I can start some of the annotation, but then I always come back and um, will add annotations or add um, comments and threads um, that are already existing. I think that's really helpful. Beverly, same question to you about um, uh, whether you annotate uh, the text as, as well. And then I'm going to follow it up with another question that was actually asked in the chat about are you grading student annotations? And if so, uh, maybe a little bit about how. So I don't uh, jump in at first with my microbiology students when they're reading the text. Um, I have them use a, a tag question and if I find a, a question tag then I could jump in and and respond with with information um, and I encourage encourage through direct instruction saying you will use tags if you have to to mark uh, your question if you've got a question or if you've got uh, if you're answering a learning objective one or, or whatever um, in my uh, when I use hypothesis with my um, biology majors then I go in and pre-annotate uh, research papers that I assign for, for reading. And then 
that helps direct the question from there. Um, and then your follow-up question. Yeah, it was about uh, whether you're grading student annotations. And if so, uh, any guidance around that? So I am grading student annotations and I give them, um, it's basically participation points. And I say, I need to, when we're, when we're uh, doing it in microbiology, I say, I need to see a minimum of three annotations per section. And an annotation uh, can be uh, a question, it can be a definition, it can be an answer to a learning objective, it can include a link to a YouTube video you found helpful. Um, any of those uh, in explaining this concept. Um, and uh, that way I, they, they have to read the entirety of the, of the assignment, otherwise they don't get credit. Um, and I do this similar kind of uh, uh, structure, and it's a research article with my biology majors, and say, I need this many annotations for procedure and this many annotations for you know, results and so forth. You mentioned that the, uh, they have to read the entire article. How do you ensure that that's happening? There was a question in the chat about this, about making sure students are reading and annotating the whole thing. Well, if they're not uh, reading the whole thing, then there's no annotation from them at the end of the article. And so therefore they wouldn't get points and my students are highly point motivated. So they want every point possible. So they read it. Got it. So you're looking at where the annotations are in, in the text to help understand that, okay. Um, I wanna come back to tag. Well, actually, I'm gonna stick with you just for a second about tags. You mentioned something about tagging learning objectives. These are things that are in your syllabus or somewhere in, in material ahead of class and the students are referring back to it, like actually in their annotations using tags. So they're, the learning objectives are in the instructions to them and then they're in, you know, the, a, a textbook will say, by the end of this section, you will have learned X, Y, and Z. And um, so learning objective X, tag it when you find the answer. Um, and uh, students, students either love tags or they hate tags. Um, and those who love them then found the power of going through and sorting their tags or their group's tags um, at the end for, for study purposes because um, for the microbiology students, I've started letting them use their annotation notes when they take their exam. And so it's a, then it's a powerful way for them to build their own study guide without me having to spoon feed them. Wow, that, uh, there's so much there. That is super cool use of tags. I feel like, Franny, we should have a whole episode just on creative uses of tags. Uh, Carlos was mentioning it as well. Um, I also really love the idea from of having a question in the tag so you know to come back there uh, as the instructor. Um, and that idea of learning objectives is, is super cool. I want us to, to explore that more. Um, the question is about grading, uh, Melanie. Um, do, you have, do you grade the student sanitations? So this, this may be this may be like a, a little off topic. So I'm I'm trying to decenter grading. So um, kind of jumped on the um, un, ungrading uh, train. Uh, so I I do um, include. Uh, so I have to give something in my Canvas uh, grade book. So I do include points for completing an annotation assignment, but I don't have any specific number or um, you know, I'm not counting. I, I, I really am hoping that they're going to annotate for, <laughs> for the sake of annotating. So I do get a range um, and I do give them credit uh, for completing an annotation assignment, but um, it's part of a larger bin that I call group or discussion work, um, you know, in, in terms of getting a, a grade uh, for that annotation assignment, but it's very low stakes. Um, it, you know, I consider this to be, you know, a formative assessment. You know, getting some feedback from what they understand, and um, um, so that that's how I handle those annotation assignments. In an ungrading universe. Um, is social annotation, you know, especially helpful in sort of understanding where students are at and how they're progressing? I, I find it to be really helpful. I, I think it's very insightful um, to see what comments that, that I'm getting and um, their 
kind of gauging their level of understanding um, some of those comments and then being able to really reach, you know, from, from just from understanding to applying um, it to another concept or linking out to some other paper or other video. Um, and and I, I, I find it to be very useful for that purpose. Carlos, have you also jumped on the ungrading train or anti-grading train? Yeah. But the Melanie is a bad influence or I am a bad influence. Either way. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I really try to, I haven't gone completely and, and my wife is on it too and is much more on the peer evaluation and peer grading each other. I have gone to a less gradients and more of a, you did it, you didn't do it and, and provide evidence. And along the lines of what Melanie said, mine are still a grade. But one thing I did this semester with the metabolic modeling class that I inherited that class two weeks before the start of it. And, and Jason, Jason got the job, but left me with a class that I was not a subject matter expert. So I was like, annotate and let's learn together. And one thing I learned was I usually do Friday deadlines, but going back to some of the questions, what I, um, what I did was if you just let me know that you didn't reach your annotation uh, requirement or you didn't annotate that week and return to it the next week uh, or whenever you have time or whenever you make connections with other papers. And it was really interesting to see people that have for various reasons couldn't annotate that week because of COVID, because of family things, because of concepts, not knowing the foundations yet, returned to some of the previous annotations and did an amazing job. And I wish I had some data, Todd, in the chat, we've been talking about surveys, but um, did an amazing job at now responding to questions based on what they had learned from previous, from future things we read or things we read in subsequent weeks. Now coming back to that article and uh, really annotating and making connections. That's so cool. Um, you mentioned Todd, who's been a great participant in the chat here. I do want to sort of now open it up to questions from uh, the audience and my colleagues have been collecting some of those, but Todd asks a really wonderful question um, that I'd love to hear you all respond to. He asks, are any of you measuring students, quote, desire or propensity to learn, end quote, before and after using hypothesis? Do you see hypothesis improving student interest and intrinsic motivation to learn? We had talked about reading compliance, and this is a, and people a lot of times mention social notation as well that sort of forces students to do the reading. Um, does it also nurture the sort of intrinsic, uh, you know, motivation to do the reading and engage deeply with it? Carlos, thoughts? I think you're still. I know you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. I don't know oh, if others can. I'm still oh, thinking. You're, you're thinking. Okay, <laughs> you great. got me with that. It's, Repeat it's a good that question, right? It's a good yeah, that's question. That's a really good question. Run we can also question. open it up at this point and let people, you know, talk over each other. But go ahead, Carlos. Or I was going to say let others answer while I think about a sure. connection. <laughs> Desire, propensity to learn, or intrinsic motivation to learn. I think that's actually a wonderful question, and it's something that I'd like to address, but I have not addressed that formally in, in my course, um, in my courses, but I think it's a wonderful question, and I, I would um, perhaps include that in some of uh, the reflections that I give uh, to my students over the course of the semester. Maybe um, that's a great, great idea, Todd. I may add that to my uh, my reflection piece and and get try to get some student feedback there. But um, it's a great question. I would like to think so, but I, I don't. I don't have the evidence. 
I have I don't have the evidence to but but or and I have an interesting class because our classes are usually lab based or although now my labs are becoming more bioinformatics on the computer and we have a 50 50 split of undergraduates and graduate students and the undergraduates are engineers or biologists or life science people and then we have grad students that are from all over so if you could have bioinformatics or functional genomics or you could have textiles and design and what i've noticed and going back to todd's question on propensity and that's why i was thinking or or wanting to learn i've and i wish i had kept track of this but i've had several graduate students say i now use hypothesis for my research because we learned in this class we annotated within this group i have this group for annotations and i'm now continuing to build within that group annotating papers related to my research but using those methods so in that case i think indirectly it gets to that question about propensity or desire to learn, but they they have a different motivation for why they are continuing to use that approach for their research. And I mean, I think that's a kind of evidence right there. I don't know about it measuring the intrinsic motivation, but certainly yep. uh, everybody here sort of pointed out that students are starting to use the tool in ways that are connecting, you know, why why do we do the reading? Do we need to do the reading? Yes, and these are the reasons. We ask questions, uh, we, we get answers. Um, we, you know, explore together. Uh, Beverly, you didn't get a chance to chime in on this question of uh, motivation to learn. It, it's a great question, but I don't have any any other insights or data on that one. All right. Uh, like I said, I think you guys have already answered it in a lot of ways in terms of the kinds of work your students are doing. Again, maybe not in terms of whether that individual students have intrinsic desire, but certainly in terms of the kinds of work they're doing is they're not just reading for compliance. They're, they're, it's clear that there's reading for comprehension and for critical thinking um, and for continued research and investigation. For any, I see you've come out of uh, muted video there, perhaps to share some questions from the audience uh, to help uh, round out the conversation here. We're, we usually uh, stop at around 11.45, but I feel like this is a rich conversation, so maybe we can have a few more questions from the audience. Yeah, there are a couple more. And yeah, and I just wanted to let the audience know too that um, in typical fashion here at Liquid Margins, we went over. Um, so if you have to leave, uh, there will be a recording of this, so don't worry. And um, also, I'll get, I'm getting into the practice of sharing the chat with people because people seem to want that. Um, so that will be available. Both of those will be available next week. Um, so yeah, just a couple questions that you haven't already answered. Um, Melanie Ruggiero, and I hope I'm, Madeline, I'm sorry, Madeline <laughs> Ruggiero, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, she'd like to know the why of using it and what do you tell them? Um, that was early on in the chat. So if it's out of context or referencing something, something else, but I think by it, she means social annotation. And then also can someone describe how social annotations help students with critical thinking? I feel like we've covered the first half there. So let's talk about critical thinking and how the, you've observed the tool, nurture that um, skill in your students. And every, my little threesome has been rearranged here. So I'm gonna completely shake it up and start this time with Melanie. I think the way that I could re relate it to critical thinking is I, I like I gave example earlier is where we um, discuss a content topic in, in the course and then use a, a news and views article. And I, I think they need to think critically because they, now they need to apply the concept to a real life um, example or scenario. Uh, and then perhaps, um, you know, during that annotation, they come up with their own questions. So some of, we talked about tags earlier, so I don't know if I use tags um, exactly the way that, that was described, but I use tags like confused or interested or want to know more. Um, and so um, quite often uh, during the, the annotation of an article, um, they will have other questions and they want to know more. And, they, and I think that's part of critical thinking. You're 
you're taking a concept that you've learned and you're applying it to a real life situation. And then you're thinking about something, you know, <laughs> something else that's related to that particular topic. So, so that would be my, my understanding of using critical thinking. And do you have a set of tags that you suggest students use as they're annotating? Those the ones you were just listing? Yeah, so I put that in the assignment. So when I, I create the assignment in um, my Canvas course, um, I ask students, um, you know, depending on what the assignment is, I do ask them to tag um, the their note annotations using those terms so that then you can segregate all of the confused yeah. or all of the interested mm -hmm. and, and you can that, filter. Yeah. exactly, you can filter them, thank you. So that, that helps um, to, to keep the discussion going, keep the conversation going. So cool, I know, I'm, I bet there's a lot of people in our audience today that would love to see some of the assignments you guys have. Uh, Beverly, I know you two are using uh, tags in a sophisticated way, um, but the question was about critical thinking. Is this a tool that helps students with critical thinking from your perspective? or how, and how? Well, I think it helps with their critical thinking um, because I see, I see them carry their, their information that they, that they questioned in the text over into our weekly discussions. We have a, a weekly eye on ethics discussion and then I can see them link the, the information that they've digested in their annotations into their, into their eye on ethics discussion. So I'm seeing application there, so. I, I think it's working well. Excellent. Carlos. I just got sidetracked by Kay's comment on on in the chat. Yeah, I, I agree one. that um, I, I think people, learners in these classes that, that I'm able to teach, and now I teach a couple of first and second semester experiences where we use hypothesis. I, I think they're doing critical thinking because this articles we pick as instructors are challenging enough that we're asking them to make connections. We're asking them to question. So one thing we've done, we've, we've teamed up with the philosophy program here and they have a, so, so Gary Comstock is a professor here and along with uh, a researcher at Harvard, uh, Nate Odie, they've developed how we argue and how we evaluate and how we evaluate or how we argue. How we argue is available online as a module. And for that 200 level uh, class, we have students as an experiment. We had students do how we argue first that six hour online class and then annotate or then uh, and critically read. And some of the questions that came up about uh, arguments, about connections, we see them in their, I'm going back to metacognition, in their reflections. We see it in their annotations. So I think it's there even without us having a specific question like how many genomes did they find or why is electronic waste a, an issue? They've made the connections. They are critically, not all, but they are critically reflecting on why is this, what, what's behind the author's use of words here? Is it something I can judge or is, is it supported by other evidence? That's great. Thank you, Carlos. Friend, anything else you want to surface at this point? Yeah, we've got another question. This is from Hart Wilson, who, Hart, thank you for being in the chat so often in um, Liquid Margins. It's always nice to see you. Um, he says, it seems to me that general articles like that could also be used to help students become more infotech literate. What are the implications for a discipline that this information is shared with the world at large? Is it any good? Not sure I understand that second part, but maybe you do. Or Hart could clarify. I'm trying to find it to, uh, to maybe read it? Re re read it one more time. So he says, it seems to me that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
<clears throat> my gosh, it seems to me that general articles like that could also be used to help students become more info tech literate. What are the implications for a discipline that this information is shared with the world at large? Is it any good? She, <laughs> parts of she. Um, oh, uh, parts of she. Part, sorry. Uh, yeah, does anybody want to take a stab at that? I think the second piece may be talking about, you know, using hypothesis and <laughs> context beyond the LMS. Um, uh, but I think we have covered the literacy piece to an extent, but anybody want to tackle Hart's question? I'm typing away. Sorry, Hart. Um, so, so we have, and this is Carly Shogren um, here at NC State, has a public science, public communication project that is part of this 200 level class. And I think that because of what they annotated and they are able to learn the terminology, then, then, then they are able to better craft this public science assignment by taking what they learned, the concepts, why is electronic waste in this class interdisciplinary, global challenging problem? How does a sustainability fit in? They are able to take the facts and, and express them in, a, in their own words for public consumption. And I think that to me is a connection of the annotation with the public facing part. Hmm. That's super interesting. And of course, you, you get some of that effect, even if you're working within the circumscribed space of the classroom, because you still are sharing that knowledge with a community, um, even if it's not the, the biggest community at large. Um, anything else on that topic, Beverly or, or Melanie, or if we talked you out here on this Friday afternoon for some of you guys? <laughs> Um, well, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate uh, all of you. Um, and I would love to follow up on some of the things we learned here today. As, as I said, tags is a big takeaway for me, the very interesting and sophisticated and different ways that you guys are using tags. Um, and if any of you are willing to share your assignments um, for us to share with our community, I think folks would appreciate them as sort of springboards for their own, um, for their own work. Um, but I just wanna close by saying, Thanks so much for spending time with us. Thanks so much for engaging so deeply with our technology. <laughs> uh, it's pretty amazing to you know, be working at a place and building a tool and then learn from the users about cool uh, and innovative ways that the tool's getting uh, implemented. So appreciate your work ahead of this, uh, this morning as well. Yeah, I just wanna thank everyone so much you know, for being here. Um, wonderful guests, great show. Um, if you do want to share assignments, you can email those directly to me and I will include those in the resources portion of the Liquid Margins page for this episode. Um, and thank you to everyone who made it here today in the chat. It was a really good chat as well. So I'll definitely be sharing that. Um, and uh, once again, thank you for joining us today and we'll just see you next time on Liquid Margins. Take care, everyone.